Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And um, I'm pretty sure that still maybe some more people may come, but I think we would like to try to finish in time. So I'll start it, you know. I think these days it's very common practice to see many news like this. You, you will see, give me a minute. I'll try to see if I can get rid of this one. You saw the news this morning from CNN that um, in Himalaya mountain in India, there was a glacier and it just fell in the river and there were a lot of people who died and some are missing, you know, okay, just this morning. Even um, you may have seen other news, which I'll share with you. Um, there's just CBS news from February 6th, which showed that climate change may be have played a very big role in, in coronavirus, okay? The whole pandemic. And the reason is that we are cutting forest and the population of bats increases and that could be one reason. Let me share another news with you. You have from Wall Street that uh, world ice is melting faster than ever climate scientists say. And that is only about a couple of days back when you saw the news, which was this morning from India, okay? Then you have President Biden here saying that, hey, we are going to change all the electric cars will be, all the federal government will be buying, everything will be electric, 645,000 fleet, all will be electric, okay. So I think um, to give you my background, some of you may know me personally, I know I have friends, I can see them here. I decided to do my PhD in solar cells way back 1973, when we had the energy crisis. And I work both in semiconductors as well as the energy and the two fields are pretty much two sides of the coin, you know, okay. So here is a detailed uh, outlines and I'm going to stay probably maybe 35 minutes, I'll try to talk and then the rest 25, 30 minutes and I'll wait as long as you want me to be here, you know, okay. Then we'll try to answer questions, you know. So the first thing which you have to understand that uh, things are some from our point of view, particularly where we are looking that uh, climate issues are very serious. And then pandemic has done some good thing. And uh, what is happening, if you look around this whole carbon emission, almost 70, 73% is energy. So we have a control, if you can solve the energy problem, 73% will be able to control. Then you have a big chunk here, agriculture, forestry, land use. Here we can make a dent. And if you follow Tom Brady and we want to be vegan, then you can help it here. I myself is a vegan, so you can help by going this area. Then uh, even we can reduce this part, but definitely the one which I'm going to talk about is this part here. We can change this completely into uh, no green, minimum, I won't say zero, but minimum greenhouse issue from this part, you know, that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay. Here is the good news. If you take around that our typical um, oil company, which is Exxon, Mobile, Chevron, big guys right here. And then you have three utility here. Two are Europeans and we have one our own United States. It's called Next Era Energy in Florida. So these three, and we compared their assets 10 years back and where they are today. So what had happened that the oil company, their oil assets are being reduced and you can see from the oil prices, their stock prices and all these one are flourishing. So if they have gone down by a factor of 10, they almost have increased by a factor of 10, you know, okay. So this is a very positive, positive news. And there are a lot of, lot of indications I can go into detail just on this topic because even um, investors are telling that, look, don't put our money anywhere. So some of the big funds, they are changing, you know, not 100%, not everybody, but I think the direction is positive. I just want to share with you, okay. Then one can wonder that why electric power? So you have to understand the basic. You have the primary sources and those primary sources are solar, wind and ocean waves. And then you have hydro, geothermal and biomass. So I classified and then two different, everybody put them in the same basket and they always say renewal. I don't like that word. I want to differentiate because these are free. You don't have to pay anything for them. This one, you have to pay something. It's not free completely, okay? But these three are completely free, you know, okay? So the electricity we generate is basically secondary, secondary energy. 
And uh, our goal is that how can we get maximum out of this one? Of course, you will prefer from the green one, but if it has to be done, that's fine. You can do this too, but not fossil fuel. Okay, that's the challenge we have as a, as a human being for all the world. Okay. The advantage of the electric power is that you can transport it very efficiently. You can exchange also from one form of energy to the another one. The only some process you cannot do, like for example, fermentation cannot be done, but virtually every other form, whether it's a potential energy, thermal energy, all mechanical energy, all you can transfer from electrical energy. And of course, that's what we're going to share with you that we are doing every day to reduce the cost. And it should be possible for us to get not free because there's no free lunch on this earth, but nearly free electrical power. So we can learn from the history. And the lesson we can learn that there are, in the, if you go back to the three centuries, then a steam engine, electrification, and the whole IT industry, these are big, big changes, which have changed the world on a grand scale. Okay. Also, you will see there are documents with study after study that how many electricity any country uses that relates to their economic issues, how, how good they are doing economically, okay? So this is where we have, if we can produce nearly free electric power and you combine with IT, which is hardware, software, everything, then you're going to see that the energy sector will be having a lot of changes, a lot of changes. And particularly I'll focus on the transportation, which will be a dramatic changes. So this is the slide which I created, and this is how I see the 21st century, that you have the IT industry already making its own dent in communication and other aspect, including manufacturing and every, every aspect of any industry you can take it. And then what we're going to do, we're going to electrify everything. And this is where the issue of free fuel electric power with the storage, we'll talk about the storage too. And then we would make everything will be autonomous not going to happen in a year, not going to happen in five years, but you're looking for the next future, 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. And here you have major issue coming from sensors, control, communication, these fuels will dominate, okay? But that's where you're looking from the transformation. Now look at this map and we get so much solar every year. This is the wind here. And of course, all these, including nuclear, these are all fixed amount, okay? So then you have all your other renewable sources are here. And it's a huge amount of electricity, I mean, energy you're getting from sun, you can particularly see, okay? So the challenge for us that we have the free energy, but can we make it nearly free? This, nothing will be free, but how cheap we can make it, that's the question for us, okay? So we, um, the conclusion which I'm going to have and I'm going to share with you based on some analysis we did very recently. And what's happening that there is plenty of sun all over the world for the whole mankind on this planet earth. Then you will see these two areas we blocked here and here. There's not a whole lot of sun. But fortunately, these are the area where you have maximum amount of wind. So this is where we can combine solar and wind together and then they can serve the entire world. All the electric power can be done just with this between solar and wind, okay? Now, I don't see a, a, a kind of a competition between the two. In my opinion, they are complementary to each other. That's the way I look at it. So around 10 years back, 2010, I got an award and they asked me to state about where, how the two work. And I said, don't worry, there was almost, PV was almost non-existent in terms of commercial world by 2010 and all wind energy. I said there are inherent advantage in photovoltaics, which are solar cells. It's a solid state device. There's no moving part and the cost will come down pretty much what we have done computer chips. So that was the statement I made about 10 years back and we'll show you that has already happened. So here is a very recent data, you can see 12, 120. And you can take coal, oil, natural gas, biomass, hydropower, nuclear, wind, and solar. So from the pollution and accident point of view, again, solar is the minimum. Then you can also see how much carbon emission will be there. And some will be there, you cannot make it perfect zero, but you can see compared to these, you can see very small carbon emission coming from solar cells, okay? So this is the, 
advantage that both solar and wind are coming into this category right here. But same time, you have significant coming from biomass, from hydropower, and nuclear is almost same as, as these two. But then this part is pretty negative, how many accident you will have, and cost is another issue. So I will not go into nuclear anything. Just It's a challenge for us that how far any nuclear reactor you have built, you can use it. But after that, there is no need for us to build any new nuclear reactor anywhere on this earth. Okay. The other point here to think that water is a very important commodity, very important. In this country, if you're in California, you know how much the value of water. And uh, for the rest of the world, there's, there are at least about 800, 900 million people who have no access to clean water. So you will see here that we use very minimum water when we are using either solar cells or we are using wind. This is another form of solar converted to electric. It's not going to make any difference in future. It's called concentrated solar power where you have a lot of mirrors and they are focusing on a tower and that tower has water or some other molten salt. And then you can boil the water, generate steam, and then business as usual as nuclear, coal, gas have been working. Utility put a lot of money in the beginning and they were looking that this will be the source and not PV, but it happened other way around. That's what we predicted several years back. The other negative part about biomass, you will see that you use significant amount of water. So carbon emission is there, but you are also using, and of course, when you look around coal, nuclear, it's too much amount of water you're using. So we also have to worry about the water issue too. If you look around this whole thing, then there are many parts of the world where we are using desalination and they are consuming a lot of energy and particularly Saudi and other Middle East people, they are just burning oil and then you're emitting carbon. So this is the site nexus of the water energy and carbon and we want to make sure that we can provide water but the energy should be consumed minimum and same time when we are producing energy, you want to consume minimum water and then same thing minimum should be the carbon. So even this is a very important point that you cannot ignore the issue of water. This is where we stand today. Uh, in, in, we can have solar as low as 1.32 cent per kilowatt hour. This is the minimum reported just about last year. Okay, so 1.32 penny, that is the minimum cost. Of course, this is conversion rate from the European to here the number can go up and down, but basically this is the lower number, very low cost. And there are many, it's not the only cost. There are many countries. I just don't want to consume your time, but this is the minimum anybody has reported so far on this planet Earth, okay? Then even IEA, which is International Energy Agency, they announced that solar power is now the cheapest form of energy. So by number of means, you can see, this is the lowest cost you can generate electric power. No other technique compete with solar. Here are data for almost 10 years between 2009 and you can see how the solar cost went down here. And this is the minimum right here. Even offshore wind also came down, but the other one have not made much change. You can see this one came down, but this is your lowest cost, okay? I would like to mention that uh, when you talk about wind, you have to differentiate between offshore and onshore. The offshore, you bring the same problem, not exactly, but which has the oil industry. In fact, many, oil industry trying to make partnership with wind energy so they can use their uh, knowledge which they have acquired in the, from the uh, oil drilling in, in ocean, you know, okay. So this is the cost issue that how the photovoltaics cost has come down. Going back to when I was a student in 70s, the cost used to be $100 here. That cost you can see 40 cent here, but I'll show you the latest curve, it's about 20 cent. So we have, and it's still there's a room to go. It's not, the journey is not over. It still will it go. It's the same thing like if you take a transistor and then it will be one billionth part when you take the first transistor built in, to, in 1948 and compared to today, okay? And of course the functionality of the transistor has also changed. So here you can see that the whole market, this is what I was trying to tell you that the market before 2010 was very small and now it's almost going exponentially. So for my friends who are young people, anytime you see exponential growth in any area, think about it, that's a transformation. It does not happen every day and does not happen in every field. But anytime you see transformation that you have an exponential graph of this nature, it has a lot of meaning. 
And that's what I was showing you this recent data, how the module cost the solar cells, it's around, sorry, going back again, 20 cent here, but it's, it's still going to go. No, I mean, it's not going to go anymore like this one, but very slowly we have done our own estimation and I think it will go to 10 cent. Then another good part about the solar cells are they're very reliable. So most of the vendors who are manufacturers today, they will give you minimum 25 years to 30 years warranty. Some of them are giving 30 years warranty. This is our own, own company here in US and power. And they are providing data that even after 40 years, 99% of the modules will be having 70% efficiency. And as a person working in the field, I know what we have, we have two glass plate and in between we have solar, but there is a polymer called ethyl vinyl acetate. And that polymer degrade a little bit. So if we can find an alternate polymer, then probably this might even go to 50 years, what we're talking about 40 years. So your nuclear reactor also does not have a lifetime more than um, 30 years. And that's what you have the solar, they are highly reliable source of electric power. Now, you would like to know that where globally we stand. So last year in, two, in, in two, 2020 data, we have not seen yet. But two, 2019 data shows that 67% came from solar and wind and the rest came from fossil fuel, only 25%. So if you will see 8% will be the difference that came from hydro and other sources, okay. And of course, out of this 118 gigawatt came from, solar, from, from photovoltaics. So what it means that typically a nuclear reactor is about a gigawatt, 1000 megawatt. We stopped building 118 nuclear reactor last year. The other interesting thing is that um, solar has definitely made a big change, as I mentioned to you. And uh, last year we, we passed, in 2019 we passed, um, passed wind. So, uh, so solar was uh, 651 gigawatt now total and wind is 644. And this gap will keep increasing. Again, as I said, these are complementary to each other, but solar already has taken over wind and it will continue to make bigger and bigger difference. And it has to do with the cost. So if you look around, this is how they are listing here that you have globally so much coal is there. King coal is dying, but not so soon. You can see so much coal is there. This is natural gas hydro, and then photovoltaic solars. But if I combine solar and wind, then things changes and hydro become number fourth. So this is what I'm saying that we are today combined total capacity. We have photovoltaics and wind almost number third, okay? The other part which I, as I mentioned to you, these are complementary to each other. So here you can, you have a wind, wind farm and you can also bring solar there. And you can see the yellow color is solar. Uh, this blue one is the wind. And this is your constant power, which your grid need. And then you can see we have plenty of constant power. If this is extra, you can do whatever you want to do it, you know, okay? So there's no competition between solar and wind. They both will exist and thrive in the future. Now, I did not put that slide here, but if we take the area of Spain, and have a 20% efficient module, we can provide the electric power to the entire world for 2030. Somebody did that calculation. I don't have the slide, but the numbers are in my mind. And someone can say, well, we don't have too much land. You have plenty of water. And the cost difference is not that bad. In fact, uh, I'll say if two pennies a typical cost for the solar power, then we, then you own the water, same panel will be here, then it will be around 3.8 cent. So it's almost double, but land is not an issue, then you, you can use water. And I don't think that land is an issue, there's plenty of land, but people have been experimenting and looking up, you can even also have floating panels like this one. We wrote a paper in 2014, and we predicted that the cost of electricity in next eight to 10 years is going to be two penny per kilowatt hour. Well, without storage, it's already there. And it's very close to storage, not exactly, but I'm pretty sure that by 2022 or 24, we will have two penny per kilowatt hour. Now, let me make one comment here. You might be wondering and saying, my, why my bill is not going low? The reason is that it depends which utility you, are, you, you live. 
So for example, Duke had very small uh, solar here in, in, in um, South Carolina. They still have nuclear. And uh, this is the price you're going to pay when you keep this thing, oh, we will need all mixed sources. You have to take drastic steps that you don't want to build any new gas plant. You don't want to build any new nuclear reactor. Whatever they are, let them work and then let them retire. Then your bill will start going down. But utility have not taken, uh, I saw a report from, from Sierra Club and uh, they even kind of ranked all the uh, utility and uh, Duke Energy did not have a good rank. How much green they are becoming, uh, Duke was not in, in, in top places. There are some utility I mentioned to you, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, next era is doing pretty good job and there are some smaller utility too. Now let's come back to the issue of storage because this is the big issue. So, um, and particularly the driver here is the electrification of transportation. So if somebody wants to know that why we are interested in the electrification of transportation, then there are four or five main reasons. Climate change, we have been talking from the very first slide. You have so many environmental issues, not only the carbon, but even methane, nitrous oxide, so many uh, and health issues. I'm not going into that direction, but if somebody will ask me a question, I'll give you the information. Then we are at a point where electric cars is still slightly more expensive. I bought a Tesla two years back and I have not gone for any service anywhere. So when you combine the cost, what you're paying the upfront price, how much you're paying for the service, it's lower cost of ownership. That's the word we use cost of ownership, okay? Unlike natural gas or any, any fossil fuel, price will remain stable for electricity. If we have a power purchasing agreement, solar farm, it's pretty much we know for the next 20 years, 30 years, what the cost of electricity will be. So I think what we are seeing here, and that's the direction we are um, moving ourselves, that the mobility going from place A to B, either yourself or the goods you transfer, and the electric power, they're going to merge. And I'm not going from that angle, which is more towards IT and software, like for example, we were connected, connected vehicles, even Uber. I'm not going into that direction. My focus will be just on the power issue. Okay. But a lot of things are going in those directions too. I'm hoping that uh, for senior citizens, their day will come. They don't have to have an, even younger people will not own car in next 10, 15 years. But for senior citizens, you just push your button, the car comes at your, your doorstep, you go wherever you want to go, and same will be true for other citizens too. So it's not too far for us to imagine, it's everything is there, that's where the mobility and electric power are going to merge. These are the data from Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and you can see how fast the battery cost is going down, okay? So this is 2019 data, in 2020 and 21, where we are, there is some Chinese company and they have shown that cost has gone down below $100. So it's a very good sign in terms of, and it's similar kind of trend as we mentioned and showed you solar cells, they're following the same path. We, I did not put too many slides here, but if I go back to how the solar cell cost got reduced, I think it's almost same pattern what we're seeing in the battery because the scale is going up manufacturing more and more. So if we talk about the storage of electric power today, and this is at utility scale, a lot of big scale projects are coming all over the country. In some here, some in other countries, Australia, for example, doing a lot. Tesla is selling big, big, big battery right there. So today you have one kilowatt hour will cost you around 0.8 cent, 1.4 cent. And by 2022, this is, this is not any study. This is the company saying that by 2020, our cost will be either half penny or one penny. So it's, and, and it's 2022. So this is where I'm very optimistic that the cost of the, if purely you have solar and, elect, and, and uh, battery and no other source, then I think around two penny you can get pretty soon. At least if not 22 by 24, you will get it, okay. There's another kind of battery, which is variant of the same thing, the lithium ion battery. The only difference is that the electrolyte is replaced by a solid electrolyte. So these are called solid state lithium battery. 
and they have made pretty big noise. You can see that this is the energy density, which means that if you have a kilogram of weight, how much energy you can store. So this is typically around 300 watt per kilogram for lithium batteries today. They can go almost 500 and even it's possible to do more in future. So there is kind of a twofold advantage we have. One, we are manufacturing more and more. And if you have the idea of supply chain, the more you, it's like even common sense, if you buy a pop, um, any, any Pepsi or Coke from a vending machine, you pay probably $1 or $2. Go to the 7-Eleven, probably they will charge 50 cent. By the time you go to Costco, you probably will be paying quarter. So that, that volume manufacturing is already happening. But apart from that, major changes, and I did not go into all kinds of details, like for example, Tesla announced that their battery would last probably a million miles, okay? Also, they announced that uh, they don't need a, uh, the packaging will be different. So a lot of things happening. I'm not going with the jargon and a lot of technical details, but uh, this is an area of extremely high growth and uh, bat battery will be the key, key, key change is going to come from the battery because solar already gone to that point. Wind already has been there. Now that, that change is coming from the battery. Wall Street had an article just two days back and I communicated with the authors who wrote on some point. And uh, what they are showing you that now the time has come, it's the battery is going to work. So once you can see when Wall Street is getting attentive, that means it's really going to be a big change. And what you have today basically look around here going from almost um, last 15 years, 2005 to 2020. And these are your consumer products, so all your cell phone, smartphone, batteries, uh, iPad, everything. Those are the consumer products going into portable electronics. And this is where the electric vehicle is coming. And this is the part I was mentioning about that the cost here is coming about a penny or half penny and it will go into that direction. So this is just, you can see uh, almost non existence to increasing. Of course, hydro, is the biggest storage, but you cannot use hydro everywhere. And uh, when you take about the value of the energy, then the energy efficiency is not there. Hydro had probably maybe 55 to 60% efficiency. Here in one cycle, uh, charging and discharging, about 90, 92% energy you can recover in, in batteries. Now, let me share with you that how we'll get the ultimate low cost. So you may have heard the name of Thomas Edison, he was the inventor of the DC power and he was the first one to give the concept of the grid. But he lost the battle with alternating current and that's where everywhere we see alternating current. But the reality is that you don't need AC power today. There are some loads which are inductive and you can locally supply them. You can put an inverter, will convert DC to into AC, but it's other way around. What we have the whole need is for DC power, all your refrigerator, dishwasher, toaster, air conditioner, all internally, when the power comes in, internally they change to DC. And then you have a device called VFD, variable frequency device, the temperature you want to change, the speed you want to change it, then it does the job, you know. So we published a paper about four years, four, six years back, seven actually now, 2014, and where we brought the same concept, which originally it was stated by Thomas Edison. So the trick is that you don't want to have too many distance. So that does not mean that you have to have solar cells on your roof. You can easily go one or two miles and it still will be like five to 7% loss, depending what kind of size of wire you have. And the loss will be I square R, current will be squared and the resistance will come into picture. But we have, done measurements, we have seen numbers, and uh, that loss will be not more than 7%. If you, 380 volt DC will give you that kind of capability. So this is the best way to convert. And uh, some of the countries like in South Africa, some part of Southeast Asia, they have a small grid, hardly five, six houses, maybe one kilowatt power. They're all using DC but not as efficiently as we can do if we adopt this as a policy. So this is one way to reduce the cost further. Then you can see this is an LED lamp and we need a driver for it and you don't have to know the electronics. 
But all I'm going to show you that these parts which you see here are useless. We don't need them. So if we have to rebuild, this PC board will be rebuilt and you don't need these parts because they, their job is simply to convert that incoming AC to DC, which your LED needs, okay? So this is just one example. Of course, um, this is what I've been doing for the last almost 10 years, that how we transform the whole electric grid. Even we published a major paper very recently where we have shown that photovoltaics and battery, you can build a whole sustainable source of electric power, okay? So this is my take on uni universally for the entire world, the solution is simple. You use both solar and wind. If you only one is doing the job, you don't need the other. As I have been saying that these are complementary. Bring storage right there. And if it's local within that one mile, two mile distance, that's what I'll call local power, then you can use whatever purpose you have the power. Here we are showing a subdivision, but it could be a mall, it could be a factory, it could be a government office, anything could be. But suppose we don't have such a luxury that uh, all power needs can be met here. Then you can go some distance, whatever you want. And then you have high voltage DC, but there's no AC anymore because even uh, when we have conventional transmission, there also AC does not offer any advantage over DC. Okay, and many countries, including here in Texas area, Oklahoma, we have high voltage DC transmission. Okay, even in English channel, between France and uh, England, they have power exchange. And what they do, they bring AC power, convert it into DC, go through. Because see, I, I, again, I don't have the list here. All over the world, these standards are such somebody using 50 cycles, somebody using 60 cycles, somebody using 110 volt, somebody using 120 volt. So there's no, no set one standard. For DC, entire world will be using one standard. So this is my bigger picture where you have Universally, you can provide electric power to the whole world and you don't have to take any charger with you or anything different. Like when you go from here to Europe, you need a converter. Otherwise you can, uh, your, your cell phone or any device will not function. Then you don't need anything. So this is the kind of long-term vision I have in my mind where you can work uniformly with the rest of the world. I won't go into the business side, but uh, this is something you, you call it vertically integrated business model. So what it means, it simply means that you are, either you have your own partnership with every vendor or you manufacture yourself everything. And this way you don't need to pay money to those salesmen and marketing and a lot of money can be cut down. Uh, several vendors in, in PV industry and in solar cells are doing exactly this much. They're just vertically integrated. Somebody may, may have a concern on recycling. Here is the concern. Just want to share with you that like your e-waste from the television, laptop, all electronic e-waste, there's no problem. We'll be recycling everything. Glass will be recycled. You can recover very nicely. Okay, glass can be recycled very nicely. Okay, even the battery will be recycled. And I did not mention to you, but for example, when we manufacture these batteries, and this is your 101 physics, 101 electricity, whatever you learn or high school physics. The battery you connect them in series or parallel and you want to add either current or voltage, then you want to have the same number. If the numbers are not same, suppose you have three batteries, one giving you five amp, another giving six, another giving seven, and you connect them series. All their voltage will be added, no problem. But the current will be the minimum. So this is happening in the real world. And we published a paper very recently on battery manufacturing, how do we cut down the cost? I will not go if this is jargon, but even Tesla, for example, they have a battery manufacturing in, Las, in near Las Vegas. And those cells which cannot be put together, they go for recycling. There's a sister company, which uh, Tesla does not have anything, but the CTO, ex-CTO of, of Tesla, uh, is the is the owner I mean the founder of that company and they recycle them. So if if somebody has a concern about battery recycling or it's not an issue, that does not mean that we know everything. Things change it every day and that's where R and D come into picture. But it's not that we concerned that we cannot recycle. And the last pretty much slide which I have that these are the major changes we talked about solar. 
the battery, electric vehicle, autonomous vehicle, and this is the controls, all kind of advanced computing, artificial intelligence, internet of things, whatever word you have heard it, it's all IT is sitting right here. Interesting thing is that what we have, new thing is coming up that we would like to do control, you don't want central control. So Bitcoin is falling into the same category. I read an article a couple of years back from Wall Street and it was written by a senator. And he was talking about same thing that the Washington DC should have less and less control. So I think this is what's already happening. These six areas are going to have a lot of impact for you. We already have personal communication, no problem. We're talking about personal power. I told you if you have enough solar and enough batteries and uh, you don't need to do anything, you can generate your own power. Mobility, we're talking about car coming to your door and stuff, that's also there. So I think this, this area is already highly sophisticated and we're going from 4G to 5G, but these two are emerging pretty fast and they will have a lot of impact. The message for younger people, you be prepared to life, lifelong learning if you want a job because things are going to change much faster than they have happened so far. So if a young person is there, and say that my uncle was laid off, he was an engineer. It's not the profession fault. The fault is that he or she was not learning um, every day where the world is changing, okay? So here is my conclusion. As I predicted in 2014, two penny per watt kilowatt is not too far away. By 2035, cost will be as low as one penny. And believe me or not, Climate change is very serious, very serious. I think you should take it very seriously. If we don't take it, I think we will have another epidemic. I may not be on this earth, but whoever will be, we will be paying worse than what we have today. I'll be more than happy to answer anybody, any question. Um, and I'll hang around as long as you have the time to stay on. Raj, we actually had some questions in the, the chat box. If sure, you, wanna... you can read the question. Um, there's a couple long ones. Do you have the ability to open the chat box? If not, I can read them off to you. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll try okay. to see if, how do I go. I if never... you want, um, you can stop sharing and then oh, I see. it okay. might be easier if you stop sharing that way. Oh, the screen, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, and now chat box will be- It's open. down at the bottom. There's a button that says chat. I can chat. see now, I can see now. Okay, okay, okay. awesome. I'll go close to see small print. I have to be close to it, okay. Um, curious to know if water is it for natural gas production is accounting for the huge amount of water that is produced with the natural gas, naturally occurring for oil and gas production. It's a mess. I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in, in, in that area, natural gas or anything, but um, it's a mess. I, I don't think we, we want to uh, glorify any way this whole natural gas business. It's worse than probably what they, that was a report about maybe a 10 years Wall Street published, but it's, it's not glorified anyway, you know, okay. So um, today it is used to, uh, I, I, I have to go back and read and, and you can send me email. Uh, you have my email and we can talk about it because I'm not an expert for uh, water use in oil industry. I'm not an expert, okay. Raj, uh, yeah. my name is Suzanne Rote, Dr. Suzanne Rote. I'm a, a professor in the chemical engineering department. I asked that question. Uh, well, I didn't actually put a question mark in there. So was, no, I, but, but, but see- I like, agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys have done fantastic thing. Any chemi chemist, chemical engineers, you have done great things, you know. But now time has come for us to think about it, that what are we doing it, you know? I mean, one is that, hey, I, it makes me, it gives me bread and butter, I have to continue doing, that's a different story. But if you're talking about as a human being and looking good for the whole world, then we have to seriously see what are we doing it, you know? So I don't, I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I just, uh, you're, you're, you talked about the water, uh, nexus, and that's something that uh, I, I do pay attention to. And um, I think you and I should talk uh, maybe tomorrow or, or tomorrow. I have a class on Wednesday. 
what is happening? We, we were working with Sandia Lab through environmental science, and we were going to get a project on um, desalination, where my job was to show that, hey, you can run very efficiently with the DC. But uh, we lost that um, project and lost almost got it. So we never got funded. But I still believe that there's a lot more to be done in water, particularly the kind of yeah. thing you guys do it, you know. Yeah, I agree, because it is a problem. Absolutely. Let's see what the next question. What are some predictions? Um, exponential graph for 2001, 2020. I mean, anytime you see uh, you, the, the battery growing exponential, EV growth is exponential. Um, those are the one PV is already past exponential. I mean, no car can go indefinitely exponentially. Okay, so don't get the wrong message that this will keep growing in ultimate, like for example, in computer chips, we have come to the point that we cannot reduce the cost anymore. In fact, we are at a point of inflection where the cost may even be going slightly up. But the advantage there is that the functionality is there. So not only you have the logic there, memory is there, some sensors, everything there, you know. So definitely uh, these are some major autonomous vehicle, for example, uh, non-existence today, may remain non-existence for the next eight, 10 years, okay? Ultimately, like California is saying and some other countries that by 2035, no more gasoline car, then everything will become very easy. And you will see another exponential graph there, you know, okay? Next question is what impact will Bitcoin have on need for electric power? Oh my goodness, you, you touch minor. This is a very, very serious issue. They consume power like hell, yeah. very big issue. So I'm not going to uh, go in favor or against Bitcoin, that's a separate issue because I think uh, we understand the theory behind Bitcoin and it's a control issue that uh, um, honestly, things can be done. Cheating will not be done. Nobody will be able to fool you. But yes, that is an area. So um, if they are listening, anybody, Bitcoin manufacturers, they can listen to me right away. And if convert to DC power, 30% you save this energy right away there. Okay, But it's a very serious issue. I agree, Trans, like um, Japan's uh, bullet train will help. Yeah, um, even if, if those trains, then you will need electric power. I was looking to our um, transportation web page today and somewhere I read it that they're talking about high speed bullet in this country too. I don't know. My job is to give you electric power. I'm not going to take one way, another way, uh, which farm you want to use it, you know. Um, how to create less energy intensive recyclable lithium batteries. Again, it's a manufacturing issue. Uh, we waste so much energy uh, in manufacturing. Uh, anywhere you have motors, and if they are not, uh, some some you do need inductive motors, but if you don't need, then DC motor can work. So even if the battery manufacturing, you can save energy. Even your Tesla battery is built from uh, thousands of AA side batteries wired together, are to recycle. No, I don't, I'm not sure who is the person asking. I'm not a recycling expert. Anywhere you see it cannot be done, that's an opportunity for you to invent. Yeah, I agree, Raj. That was me asking the question again. Yeah, so you, you I, I mean, I don't think, uh, maybe I have two, three friends in here who are probably as old as I am. All of you are younger. Anything which is like you see a problem, that's your opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, um, one of the faculty members is studying batteries and trying to figure out how to make them bigger with the same storage cap capability so that it, you have a or, or have a liquid system that can be recycled it's much more easily than a solid system so yeah there's a lot of research in that area yeah i mean that's where uh, the, the co-founder of tesla not the original but with elon musk he's a younger guy and he quit at a time that he saw that hey i can do make a bigger change by going to recycling so that's where recycling a lot of other companies looking to. What do you see as the biggest uh, resistance to convergent DC policy? I, I wrote an email to these two, two uh, authors of that Wall Street article and their reply came back that it's a resistance will come from the policy. So I have limited energy and I'll try to work on this one. I was in Washington DC with the Congress way back in 2016 
but then Republicans came in power. So nothing happened in four years. I think we'll try to do it back again. But it's a policy issue, not technical issue. There are hundreds and hundreds of document all over the world. Even um, Germans are doing something. And the good part is that the Chinese don't understand. If they understand, they can do it tomorrow because they don't have to wait for the rest of the world. So they're still waiting that anything US does, they will copy, make it better than you and sell it to you. So better as a US citizen, do it yourself, you know. I'm still here to answer any question. Chat box is nice, but same time you can just talk one to one. We still have extended time, only 7.17, 13 minutes in the official <laughs> time. Yeah, uh, Raj, I'll tell you a story instead of ask a question. So uh, back in the early times uh, in, in Edison's age, there were three people, Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, that were vying for uh, the U.S. government's attention to set up a quote-unquote electricity network. Mm -hmm. And Edison uh, put together his uh, wood board with wires and uh, little model houses and, and power lines and um, to demonstrate the DC power distribution system for the United States. And Westinghouse came in and said, oh, but that'll kill everybody because they won't be able to control the, the power right. surges. And it's gotta be alternating current going uh, uh, across the system. And the government decided that, well, you know, uh, the DC power reduces the line losses, so that's good. So let's do that for the big side. But then we have to have transformers going into everybody's house, converting the power to alternative, uh, you know, AC current, right. AC. And uh, Tesla was just way out there and he couldn't even get his head around talking to the government. So he was just shoveled to the side. But in fact, he was the smartest one in the whole bunch. So true, so true. He, but unfortunately, he died uh, very poor and in a miserable condition. Yeah, yeah. He he was a, a poor communicator, unfortunately. Yeah, that's so. right. That's right. But I think that's where we have to think as a human being that um, why do we need to continue doing same thing? And that's a matter of policy than any technical issue. Yeah, agreed. Now, having worked overseas and and used uh, uh, 240, 220 to 240 volt power, uh, I'm a fan. I have a an espresso machine that I bought overseas and I decided not to change the power supply and just bought a, bought a, a converter and heats the water up faster and works better with higher voltage. Yeah, I mean, there's so many advantages we can go one after another, but the barrier is the policy. It's not the technical issue. Yeah. Say Raj, can you hear me? This is Frank. Yes, Frank, I can hear you very well. Thank you. All right. So my question is, is the electrification of mobility or food choice more important in combating the climate crisis? I think if you, if you, if I go back to that original car, you can see, let, um, I mean, let me see if I can just get the numbers correctly and bear with me just one second. I'll give you here. Um, Bear with me one minute. I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, we have the answer to your question. Give me one minute. Um, okay, the Agriculture is 18.4% and including forestry and land use. And uh, transportation is around 17%. So they are basically almost same, okay? So if you want to get rid of um, greenhouse, then uh, how you can make people vegetarian and vegan? That's not easy. People will not give up eating meat. But yes, electrification we can do it very easily. 
the numbers are pretty much same. You, you, I'll send you the file. You can see that yourself. These are almost 16, 17 percent coming from both. You know, but uh, there's no 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 mechanism. There are not too many Tom Brady. You know. Thank you. You're welcome. So Raj, I, this is Linda Holt. I found out about this uh, presentation through the Sierra Club uh, information, but I work at Schneider Electric, which manufactures electrical equipment, yeah. and you were speaking about con uh, continuous learning uh, for the young people. Right. I can tell you that uh, our company definitely, uh, you know, that's one of our principles that we have learn every day. So um, actually, I will be documenting this presentation you've given as one of my learning hours. Uh, but we have to document at least 80 hours of learning a year. Uh, most of us actually obtain more than that. But I appreciate your presentation. Thank you, Linda. And we appreciate working with you. Send me email tomorrow because we may have something to work with you guys, you know. That'd be great. Thank you, we'll Linda. Do. Appreciate it. Raj, there are two more questions in the chat box that okay. came in. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned. Um, what power becoming so important? Okay, the question is on hydrogen. Let me give you my opinion on hydrogen. Um, in 1976, I was a student and I gave a presentation in Washington, D.C. on solar cells. And there was also a paper on fuel cell. So hydrogen already being used in a number of places today. So it's not that we are not producing hydrogen. Right now, uh, you, you go back to not senior Bush, but ju junior Bush time, 2003, 2004. Lot of money was floating around. Lot of money was floating around on hydrogen. Nothing came up. Now, why you see the hydrogen word for two reasons. The oil company are sensing that we are going to be out of business soon, much sooner than they thought. They will make two faces the story they present outside to their shareholder and everything, it will be different. But inside they know that, hey, the end, end game is coming, whether it's five years or 10 years or 15 years, but it's not 50 and 100 years. So they are pushing. So basically you have three kinds of uh, hydrogen. One is that uh, coming from just any fossil fuel, and uh, another one, you can capture the carbon. And the third one, you use solar electricity or wind electricity and then produce, you know. There is not a single company on this earth, which is purely fossil fuel, I mean, fuel cell, and they have made any profit. There is one actually, I have a slide and I did not use it here. If you want, I can show you. Uh, it's called, um, it's in California. And they, every quarter they lose money. So even the gospel was that, um, okay, you can make these cars, maybe small trucks, but you cannot make these heavy duty trucks, which are going to go from um, one side of the country to the other one, 800 miles, you know, and bring your all food, vegetables and everything. And you cannot do it, you know. In fact, Bill Gates and um, Elon Musk had a kind of, a, 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 Bill Gates made a statement that you cannot use, um, batteries for that purpose. And I'm sure some of you who knows how Elon Musk is very aggressive and he just replied back to him in some way. Very recently, a report came from one of the national lab and you had to understand the science. The way, the, the shape of the truck, the way it is, there's a huge weight sitting of that engine. You are carrying that also with you. But when you are designing this new electric truck, and I'm talking about the heavy duty truck, the shape is not going to be the same. I don't know if there's any mechanical engineer, but there's a whole aerodynamics here. And they will be designing in a different way. So as a result, the weight has been reduced, the aerodynamics has been changed, and the battery is going to take there too. So hydrogen is finished for there too. That does not mean you don't need to do research. Place where we cannot do much, in the ocean, transportation in ocean, transportation in air, those remains open, unless tomorrow, um, I have a dear friend here who, is a who used to be a material scientist, now retired. 
if their friends and our friends in material science, they invent some new material with battery so light, totally different weight. But it's very difficult for us to see that how in aviation, though 100 miles, 200 miles, those planes are already running on battery. But I'm talking about continent going 1500 miles from Sydney to Los Angeles. I don't think battery is a solution today. I cannot say. So there is a room for hydrogen, but for as far as the earth is concerned, uh, surface transportation, I think it's pretty much hydrogen out of picture. Why? Too much expensive, just cost. Because thermodynamics does not allow you to take two steps. First, you're creating electricity. Now you're going to back again, two steps, you know. So even somebody way back um, 2005 or 2006 wrote a paper based on thermodynamics and economics. And I follow that more closely. And uh, I go with the dollars and cent. Show me, sh show me the book, where is the money? And if the money is not there, you cannot do it. So these companies, which are big advocate of um, hydrogen, they're just bankrupt. I don't know how, they are just surviving because this, uh, these oil company are pushing them. You know? okay. So I hope I answered the hydrogen issue. There's one more question here. Electronic heaters are prepared at much lower efficiency than propane or natural gas. Is there a method you have found out that allows electric to be more competitive? Well, the, 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 see why fossil fuels survived 100 years and it has done great job. We cannot demean and we, we criticize fossil fuel, okay? The nature gives you so much energy content there, okay? And of course, if you talking about there, that inductive heating can give you better results, you know? So not just the resistive heaters, but you have to use inductive heaters and they were more efficient. Uh, I don't think there is any more question in the chat box, but we still have time and anybody want to ask any question? <laughs> Hi, Raj, Frank again. So yeah. what is the role of nuclear energy in the next decade? I think uh, nuclear is not going to die because it's a weapon. So uh, any country, it doesn't matter which country, I have not seen any sent country, whether it's India, China, Russia, France, anybody, everybody, yes, it's a, it's a bargaining tool. Hey, let's get on the table, how we're talking to the Iranian. So it's not going to disappear, but what it will become, it will become so expensive that the citizens will revolt. I don't know. It's more with the citizens will revolt, but the, any kind of a government doesn't matter whether democracy or so, they're not going to give up on nuclear. That's, that's the way I, I look at nuclear. If you remember when Perry was an energy secretary, he said openly that, look, we need manpower. So we cannot just shut completely R&D and all these things. So they, there is maybe one or two program here and there in the country who still have nuclear energy program, but otherwise all major uh, schools, everybody has shut down, nobody has a program. So they, they want to keep them, otherwise you will not have any manpower, you know. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Roger? Yeah. Uh, this is Iyad. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, solar panel. Do you think um, maybe like in the coming decade or Two decades from now, do you think we uh, the world will will not use the power uh, that the traditional power plant because we have uh, solar power and we could use it uh, on on the top of the houses? Absolutely, you can see the data, the graph, how it is going. It's like um, four, if, uh, fourth largest today after coal, natural gas, and hydro is fourth largest. So you will have more and see it, it all depend on the policy. Like for example, certain countries, certain states, they have law that built a new house. You got to put solar on the roof. So it's all policy. Where we are today, we are lacking more policy because remember who is going to fund these elected members of Congress or, or state, big, big companies. So it's, it's the interest of those big companies, which is a hurdle and uh, how long they can do it and ultimately market force will take over, take over. Like this is not an issue between blue and red. You have Tennessee, our neighboring yeah. state, go to the airport, all uh, working on solar. So- Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, it's a matter of policy. 
And uh, I see so many hurdles. I have no problem if there's a nuclear reactor which was built, it's generating electricity, let it complete its time. But don't build a new one. So um, I, I mean, um, I have four or five people here in, in audience who work with us. We tried to teach Clemson University that don't build a gas plant. We could not teach them. They don't want to learn. Why? Because they were in bed with, with Duke Energy. And Duke, Duke does so many things for Clemson, so they cannot say anything to Duke, you know. So policy is killing us, not the technical stuff. I mean, all my colleagues here, Sujan asked something, everybody who, who, who has to do with science and engineering, we're doing our job and we are on the right, right track. But what about the policy? That's where the business businessmen eat the pie, business policy eat the pie, and we just the crumbs. That's what we get, engineers get the crumbs, you know. So I have no doubt in my mind that the if, if we take pro solar policy, pro wind policy, pro storage, all these things, and how fast we can do. Even one of our uh, um, friend here in, in uh, Clemson, she was, uh, we work very hard that she will be elected and we'll send her to, to Columbia. We could not send it, somebody else got elected. So it's a tough battle. Mm -hmm. Raj, Frank again. So how is the, combined uh, heat and power plant. Lauji, um, Lauji, I, I, can, okay. I, can, I can, Tony is a very dear friend. I respect him a lot. I'm giving a public statement, it's being recorded, so I'm not afraid. Just doesn't want to learn. They don't want to learn, period, that's it. Now, is it coming from the trustee, from the president, from where it is coming, I have no clue. They don't want to learn. They're still talking about that, oh, we'll do some, they can get R&D money, that's fine. I have no problem that anybody doing research, it's okay. But when you have to look at your own interest in, in not only you and me living here in, in Clemson area, but for the whole world, then you have to think beyond your own interest, beyond your state interest, beyond your school interest, then you have to look globally. I have done my whole my life looking in the global interest, you know. Then you have to serve your local people. So I don't think it make any sense. Even, even Frank, Duke University, which is also being served by Duke Energy, they were given the same proposal of CHP and they refused. Mm -hmm. they, yes. they, they, they refused. Our guys say, why? If it does not work in North Carolina, how it can work in South Carolina? I don't see, it doesn't make any sense to me. Raj, this is Ellie. What countries do you think are taking the lead on implementing solar? China is, of course, number one. Okay. But we are not far behind in solar. India is number two. India, is, they have a solar farm which is as big as 2,000 megawatt, means two nuclear reactors in a single place, largest one on this earth. So we're not far behind on solar. That's the good part. And this is why I keep saying that it has nothing to do with blue and red. Mm -hmm. There are many Republican friends who support, many. So it's nothing to do with blue and red issue. It's a question of business interest. Though, think about it, Ellie. The entire fossil fuel industry globally is 40 trillion, 40 trillion. Okay, they have put their money there. And now tomorrow you tell them that, hey, this is going to become zero. Will they let it happen? No, they will fight. So that's what's happening. It is nothing to do with, with the cost and those things. Then of course, uh, as a consumer, public is not full. That's what you call market force. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer of market force. That's what we did whole life that, hey, um, let them not accept today, but when the market force will take over, that's what had happened with solar. So, so do you think, Raj, that it's an issue of educating the public or? Absolutely. That's why I, I, I mean, I'm not in the College of Science. I have nothing to do with them. But I saw this, hey, it's a great opportunity. I mean, in Sierra Club, we always talk. But how many people we can talk? I said, it's a great, even if I can convince to one person, and if that person is young, <laughs> then that is the best bet for me. You know? I don't need 10 or 100, just one person. Then that one person will probably educate somebody else, you know. So that was my reason that I volunteered right away when I got this opportunity, you know. Thank you for what you do, Raj. Thank you, thank you.
think Ethne is waiting for, should we continue or anybody has any question? She's very patient, has been here for almost like 15 minutes before the time. You know? So I really appreciate, give a big hand to her because she is a big help to us. You know? Ask if anybody else has other questions. Uh, I'm Nishantir. Uh, I don't, I don't have a question. Uh, uh, it's, I just wanted to say like, it, it is like so nice to hear your talk after so many years. Nishant is my PhD student. He worked for Intel. So I just want to introduce you. Um, he was here yeah. at Samsung. He did PhD a couple of years back, I think 2013 or 14, and now he worked for Intel. Thank you, Nishant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I got the uh, email from LinkedIn. That uh, so it was. Uh, so yeah, in future, if you have any talk and it's virtual, I'll send uh, it. Please I'll, put send, it on I'll, I'll send it to you directly. Thank you, Nishant. I appreciate you. Know you are the yeah. only brave person yeah. from that LinkedIn connection came in. You know. Yeah, it's, it's so nice. Th thank you. And so educating, like really. We appreciate that. Thank you. All right, everybody has my email and my colleagues who are at Clemson, we can connect with each other, but even from public at large, anybody, please feel free, our job is to serve you. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thank you.